there are some things that you know are definitively the wrong thing. Yes. And then don't, don't go in that direction. Like, <laughs> but then there's this whole range of things of like, well, maybe this, maybe this. Mm -hmm. And part of what keeps us stuck is because we're trying to make the best yeah. decision. We're like, okay, I have these 10 options, uh, but I want to pick the best one. And we don't know which the best one is. So we just sort of default to not picking any of them. But if we were thinking rationally about it, we would say, well, any of these 10 decisions <laughs> would be better than sitting here and doing nothing. Uh, and so I just need to stop trying to make the best decision and just make any good decision that's better than the default. Welcome back to the Max Out Show, where today I'm joined by Dr. Alice Korb, a professor at UCLA that helps people use neuroscience to live better lives. He's a three-time winner of USA's Ultimate Frisbee Coach of the Year, as well as the author of The Upward Spiral, using neuroscience to reverse the course of depression one small change at a time. So Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Super excited to have you. So before we dive into these really practical steps that you talk about, for really changing our lives for the better, I first want to establish sort of a base here. So when you talk about reversing depression and finding happiness, are we talking about two separate constructs here or really one you know, sliding scale going from depression to happiness? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, uh, I've realized that they're kind of the same thing. Uh, when I originally wrote The Upward Spiral, which is my first book, um, it was after studying depression in um, my PhD program in neuroscience for several years. And I wanted to like take a lot of the science that I had read and like translate it into a way that people could actually put to use in their lives. And one of the things I started to understand about studying depression is that there's nothing technically wrong with the brain in depression. Like it's not functioning the way that you want it to, but it's not like that there's something wrong with your brain. Like you're missing a brain circuit, which is how it sometimes feels like, or that, you know, something's not working. It's just this, the way that the brain regions are communicating with and regulating each other isn't optimal. And so there's this whole bunch of things that you can do, little life changes that you can make that actually start to change the activity and chemistry of those circuits. And because there's nothing like wrong with the brain and depression, these are just the kinds of things that anyone can do to change the activity and chemistry of these key circuits that uh, reduce stress or increase resilience or improve happiness. And like, if you're depressed, which is where a lot of these things have been studied, they sort of get you out of depression but if you're not you know technically depressed you're just kind of feeling you know a little bit stuck or a little overwhelmed uh these are the same kinds of tools that you can use to be a little bit happier and calmer and more resilient in the face of stress yeah i think one important insight here is that like you don't suddenly wake up one day with depression or you don't suddenly wake up one day with happiness either, right? So both mm -hmm. of these are, are really things that through constant repetition of thoughts or behaviors, we, we start to create in our lives, right? So can you talk to us about this, you know, upward or downward spiral and what do you mean by that? Yeah, uh, well, I think we're all sort of familiar with the, the concept of a downward spiral where you make a bad decision or, you know, some thought pops into your head like, ah, oh, it's not worth the effort to, you know, go to that party. And then so it changes, you know, the actions that you take. And then as a result of that, you know, you just kind of feel worse and you feel lonely or isolated or stressed. And then you really don't feel like, you know, talking with people or going to do fun stuff. And that's because, uh, you know, the actions that we take or the thoughts that we have can change our brain's activity and chemistry. And if you if you do something that inadvertently makes you more stressed out or unhappier, well, then that's going to trigger the habits, the coping habits that you have 
for how you deal with stress or unhappiness. And if the coping habits that you've practiced your whole life aren't ideal for that specific situation that you're in, then they're going to cause their own problems, which then cause more problems, which then, and then you sort of spiral down. That's why you feel really stuck. And those are the, the kind of dynamics that lead to depression. It's the this kind of dynamics that we all have uh, because that's how the human brain works. It's just that some people's brains are like even more reactive and they're more likely to get stuck further down. Uh, but I think we've all sort of had situations where like, oh, it just sort of spirals out of control. And the good news is that the same sort of dynamics works in the other way. That if you can just start to make one small change that's like different than the default or different than what your habits are pushing you towards, then that can start to cause a, a small positive change in say that, you know, signaling of serotonin or dopamine or changes in activity in uh, the prefrontal cortex, which helps to regulate emotions. And if you make one small change there, then, oh, now it makes it a little bit easier to make the next change. Like if you um, can manage to get a little bit more exercise, then that actually can improve your sleep quality. And when your sleep gets better, then your brain is more rested. You have more energy and more ability to focus. Sure, you could exercise more because you have more energy, but you also, it's more fun to do other stuff. And that's how it spirals up uh, uh, in a positive way. Yeah, so the, the, the beautiful insight, I guess, here is that at any moment in time, not like a year from now, but really every day and every moment of our life, we're at this, this crossroad, right, between going up or going down. And every single time we have this decision, right, to make mm -hmm. one small change, like you say, that then has this trickle down effect further down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, uh, one of the things, of the way you, uh, way you phrase that, I think is absolutely correct, that you have this choice. Uh, I think one of the ways that people get led astray though, is to think that they always have to be happier. Yeah. Uh, and that is, is really problematic because a lot of people sort of get into this um, mode where happiness isn't like a choice and productivity and success isn't a choice. They just, it's just like treadmill. They're like, oh my God, I have to do it. And it's almost like pathological. And I, I see this in a lot of like successful people. I sort of think of it as like the Silicon Valley uh, view of happiness. It's like, okay, that didn't work. Okay, pivot and do this. And I go do the happy. And you're sort of like manically, like frantically trying to be happy all the time. And that's not how your brain works. Like that's not how happiness works. Uh, happiness is not the absence of negative emotions. Sometimes it's just learning to accept those negative emotions. That sometimes you feel better, sometimes you feel worse, and that's fine. Or recognizing that oftentimes your negative emotions represent something meaningful to you. Like if you, you know, are totally in love with someone and they, you know, they're not sure about you and they break up with you and you're heartbroken, like it's helpful to realize like, oh, that those negative emotions, that heartbreak that I'm feeling is because I care so much. And when you think like, oh, no, no, I need to get rid of these negative emotions as fast as possible. Like it leads you to make, you know, choices that aren't necessarily in your long-term best interest. And so uh, the reason why I emphasize that is like these tools to, you know, be happier or less stressed are really helpful tools, but just like any tool, there's no tool that's perfect for every single situation. And so people can overutilize this, like, I need to get out of these negative feelings. I need to get out of these negative feelings. And I think one of the most important tools, it's actually a part of the upward spiral that people don't use enough, is just acceptance mm -hmm. and experiencing your feelings. Like, yep, yeah, this sucks. And can't do anything about it right now. And like, that's okay. I actually think that's one of the things that um, people can use during this pandemic a lot. Like, <laughs> yep, it's a worldwide pandemic. There's wildfire. Like, yep, this sucks. Like, okay. Like, 
with things that are uncontrollable, the only sort of useful thing to do with them is just accept them. Um, and by the way, this is, I know you mentioned that a lot of athletes listen to your podcast as a coach this is something I think about a lot of times because, uh, there are times when, you know, you're, you're shooting everything perfectly and other times uh, where it starts to fall apart. And one of the reasons that people get into trouble is because they always, they try and overfix everything. Like, Oh my God, why did I miss that shot? Why do I need to change it? And like, no, sometimes you just, your shots go in. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you're feeling more confident. Sometimes you don't. And when you, when you realize like, Oh, certain things you can't control and I should just, accept those, then I can redirect my attention towards the things that I can control uh, that are important. Yeah. And I mean, it also ties into this, this whole aspect of self-awareness that, that you talk about, right? In terms of mm -hmm. like understanding how we're feeling in the moment, understanding that we don't always a hundred percent need to feel happy, right? Understanding mm -hmm. that's okay. And having this non-judgmental attitude towards those right. feelings, right? Without, right. you know, trying to get ourselves down. I think right. this is hugely critical. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the reason when, when negative emotions, like when, de when depression becomes a problem, it's when like it becomes overwhelming and like gets in the way of you like actually living your life. Uh, and so sometimes when we feel bad, we overfocus on those negative emotions. It's like, okay, well, how is this negative emotion actually getting in your way? Like even if you're depressed, people focus too much. Like I need to, feel happy first and then I'll start hanging out with my friends and then I'll start working on, you know, my new book or like, no, no, no. Like you don't need emotions to like call a friend. You don't need to feel like it to start writing. You could just start doing those things. Uh, and so feelings are something that you don't have direct control over. But if you just start to make small changes in your like actions or some of the thoughts that you pop it, that pop into your head, or even just the environment that you're in, then you can set yourself on a path towards an upward spiral. For sure. So to really bring this point home, can you share with us this mountaineering metaphor that, that you share in your book? Oh yeah. Um, that, uh, that was in the chapter on, um, decision making. And, uh, it was really this, um, this book that I read that really stuck with me. Uh, now I'm blanking on the title is, a uh, um, touching the void or into the void, touching the void. I think I always confuse it with into thin air <laughs> by John Krakauer because they're both mountaineering books, but in this one where it's stuff goes wrong uh, in this one, it's two um, mountain climbers who climb this previously unclimbed peak in Peru and they make it to the top. Like spoiler alert. That's in like the first five pages. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, on the way down though, one of them breaks his leg and they're all, by themselves and like the other one like starts lowering him down he doesn't know uh how they're gonna get out of it and this also this is like in the first 10 pages uh and like they're stuck and lost and alone and they don't know what to do uh and this i sort of think is like analogous to the situation you're in when you're really feeling stuck like every decision feels wrong you're like well if i knew the way to go i would go there but I don't, and I, you know, you question everything that you do. And this is sort of the situation that he says, um, he describes uh, as being in. And I'll, another spoiler, by the way, he survives because he's the author of the book. Uh, but um, he says like in, you know, in a mountaineering situation like this, in the kind of disaster, um, you just have to keep making decisions, even if they're wrong decisions. Because once you stop making decisions, you're stuffed. Yes. And I really like that idea because in life, we don't have enough information usually to know what the right decision is. But the one thing that you do know for certain is that the situation that you are in right now isn't tenable. Like that if you, like in his situation, if you sit there and do nothing, you're going to die. So while you're, your brain wants to try and figure it out. If you're like, well, I could go down this path, but what if there's a cliff there? I could go down this path. What if there's a rock site? Well, it doesn't matter because you know for certain that you can't stay here. Yeah. So if you go down one path and you realize it's the wrong path, well, great. Then you can make another decision from there and then you keep making another decision. 
But oftentimes it's our fear of making the wrong decision that keeps us from acting. And I, the advice I often give to people is like, if you know what the right answer is, do it. <laughs> and if you don't know what the right answer is, then like, it doesn't matter. Like you don't have enough information. Maybe by doing something, then you'll gain more information. And you realize like, oh my God, I, I'm going the wrong direction. Well, good. Then you weren't able to know that until you went in that direction. Yeah, that's so important. So this, this idea that clarity comes from action has really become a mantra of mine for over, over the last couple of months, right? Because like you mm -hmm. say, if when you're starting out and when you feel that anxiety and you don't know where to go, it can be so easy to get stuck in that moment, right? But the reality is that any step in sort of the right direction is going to be better, better than right. nothing, right? As and long as you know, like there are some things that you know are definitively the wrong thing. Yes. Then don't, don't go in that direction. Like... <laughs> Then there's this whole range of things of like, well, maybe this, maybe this. And part of what keeps us stuck is because we're trying to make the best yeah. decision. We're like, okay, I have these 10 options, uh, but I want to pick the best one. And we don't know which the best one is. So we just sort of default to not picking any of them. But if we were thinking rationally about it, we would say, well, any of these 10 decisions <laughs> would be better than sitting here and doing nothing. Uh, and so I just need to stop trying to make the best decision and just make any good decision that's better than the default. Uh, I like to sometimes think of it like in another way of being lost in the wilderness. Like if you, you know, wandered away from the trail and you don't know where it is, you're kind of lost. Uh, if you can just walk to the top of a hill, you can gain more information. Like pick, you know, maybe that's the direction the trail is, but if you don't, then you'll be able to see and you'll gain more information, even if it's the right way or not. But if, if in sitting there, if you can sit there and think about it for a minute and then realize, oh, it's over there and then go in that direction, great, then sit there and think about it. But at some point, if sitting there and thinking about it doesn't reveal the answer, then just sitting there and thinking about it more is just wasting time. Yeah, for sure. And just to bring it back to, to the topic of this conversation, for anyone, you know, stuck in depression or stuck in anxiety that's listening to this right now, any step in the right direction is going to be better or nothing, right? Any step of, you know, any of the techniques that we've talked about before, whether it's you know, getting more sleep or getting more exercise, or any of the things that we're going to talk about in the next couple of minutes, or anything even that has helped you in the past, you know, for our listeners, you've experienced in the past, you've done things, you've maybe hung out with friends, you've had your favorite food, and you realize it made you feel better. And so anything that you know helps you is going to be a step in the right direction. I think that is so powerful to yeah. just remember. Yeah. One of the things I think that keeps people from doing that is because uh, if they take a step in the right direction and they were assuming that it was going to solve all of their problems, <laughs> then they're, they get the wrong conclusion from it. Basically, they're like, oh, I heard exercise is good. Okay, so then I'll start exercising and then I'll feel better and amazing. <laughs> and they exercise and like, they feel a little bit better, but not like totally completely better. So then they're like, oh, well, that was dumb and stupid of me. And then like, let me try something else. And it's important to sort of like manage your expectations that there generally is no one thing that's going to solve everything. And so just make a tiny little change and don't think it's going to solve everything, but just realize like, oh, it's better than the default. Uh, and then, you know, take, make another little change from there. Uh, some of the, the way I like to describe this sometimes is like how, um, you know, you could know that fertilizer is good for growing plants. Uh, but you can also have unrealistic expectations that would make you give up about the usefulness of fertilizer where like you sprinkle a little fertilizer, you sprinkle a little water, and then you come back the next day and you're like, where are my plants? <laughs> where, where is it? <laughs> and you need to realize like, well, no, like, Water is essential for plants. Like if you don't water them, bad stuff is going to happen. Like fertilizer is really helpful for plants. Uh, but if you just do it once, you know, and then give up because you're like, oh, I didn't solve everything all right immediately, then you're going to fail to continue to nurture it. And so these 
things like exercise or socializing, these are the things that give your brain the chemicals, like the chemical fertilizer it needs to start thriving. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately. Just keep giving it those inputs and allow it to grow in that direction over time. Yeah, I think these, this aspect of setting the, a realistic time frame for improvement is so critical here, right? Because like you say, like if you expect improvements too quickly and nothing comes, yes, you're going to give up, right? But if you just say or accept that if you just keep putting in the fertilizer, if you keep putting in the water, at right. some point it's going to show up, right? At some point, right. the flower is going to bloom. You're going to experience more happiness. And I think that's so powerful. And just so I'm really like, curious. Just like athletic, I was going to say, just like athletic performance. So, okay, I'm going to work on, you know, I want to be able to dunk a basketball. Okay. And so you, you work on your jumping really hard for a week. And you're like, I still can't do it. Ugh, I'm never <laughs> going to be able to do it. Like, and it's like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do it. Like jumping to that really quickly. That's just a mental habit that we get stuck in. And that leads you to giving up too easily. A lot of times you realize like, oh, I'm frustrated that it's really hard to do this. Okay, I'm frustrated. So I, I could stop or I could realize that that frustration just represents how important it is to me. So I'm going to keep going. And even if it took me two years to do it, then it's worth it. So I'm going to keep doing it. And that takes you down that path. But a lot of times, you know, when we're really impatient for something, that gets in our way. Although interestingly, p impatience is kind of a, a virtue because it gets us to start doing stuff. But if that, is a, if that same impatience then makes you give up, well, then it's problematic. So use your impatience as a tool to get you to start doing stuff. And then when you feel like you want to give up, okay, well, then use some other tool like mindfulness or, you know, whatever. And so that's how, like, the upward spiral is all about using, recognizing that you have different tools and they're good for different situations. And a lot of times we get stuck when we keep using the same tool over and over and over again, and it's just not the right tool for the situation that we're in. Yeah, that's such a great way of looking at it. So before we you know, dive deeper into, into more tools that people can really use, I'm really curious, what do you see as the, the most detrimental and destructive habits of thinking and behaving in people that, that cause them to, to go downwards in that spiral? Yeah, I think um, unrealistic expectations are a big one. Um, like, for example, a lot of times people who are depressed seem very pessimistic. Uh, and people are like, oh, just stop being so pessimistic, like, and just, you know, things will work out fine. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think sometimes that pessimism uh, develops as a way to protect themselves against their unrealistic optimism. Like wow. if you're really depressed and someone's like, here, try this pill. It's going to solve everything. You're like, Oh my God, this is going to fix everything. And then like when it doesn't fix everything and it just fixes a little bit, then what your expectation is compared to reality, you know, doesn't match it. And then you're really frustrated, even though you're still a little bit better. Uh, it didn't fix everything. And that, that can come from when we're just like unrealistically optimistic. Like I always think that I can drive anywhere in LA in like 15 minutes. I don't think that consciously. <laughs> it's just like, I've noticed that when I'm like, Oh, I should leave now that that's sort of what my natural reaction is. And so I'm constantly frustrated like, Oh my God, there's traffic. And, and I realize like, Oh, my frustration isn't with, the traffic per se, it's with myself because I keep falling into this unrealistic expectation. And so instead of just trying to change the world, like realize, oh, I could change those expectations. Um, and then one of the other big ones that goes along with that is self-criticism. Uh, when we're really harsh on ourselves, when we think that we should be able to control everything, uh, then... Um, if things don't go perfectly, we criticize ourselves and that just gets us more stressed out and more uh, down and demotivated. And uh, that can really get us stuck. And so like uh, with the traffic analogy, for example, like I uh, make a mistake by leaving too late and then I yell at myself and get criticized or whatever. And like, 
by the way, that doesn't change your habits. Like self-criticism sort of like keeps you stuck in the same loop. And uh, that's why it can be destructive because when you're feeling stuck, if you just yell at yourself and get mad at yourself, well, nothing's going to change. You're just going to be stuck in this sort of loop of self-criticism. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of these, these techniques have this, this underlying skill of self-awareness where you need to learn to study yourself and to understand yourself and to see what are your natural sort of habitual reactions to those negative emotions and, and then learning to become more aware of them in the moment and then change them actively, right? Mm -hmm. So how can people develop more of this present moment focus where they, they notice themselves just reacting in a negative way more quickly than before? Right. Uh, well, one of the ways is to like look back at how you've reacted to situations for the last six months uh, or year and just like, oh, that's interesting. I've noticed like I've every time I'm like stressed out, I procrastinate or what like if you notice this pattern over time, then you might be quicker to recognize it when you fall into it or talk to other people like what do you think of how I get stuck? And they're like, oh, well, you get really angry every time. Like, and you're like, when you realize that you have a pattern that you continually get stuck in, then you can notice it developing a little bit quicker. Um, uh, another uh, key way of doing that is uh, of identifying, you know, what's going on in yourself is through mindfulness. Um, just taking a moment either through mindfulness meditation or to really just like pay attention uh, to the present moment, and try and uh, devote your attention to it fully. And a lot of times we get distracted, you know, by our thoughts or emotions. And if you can practice what, what oftentimes happens when we get distracted by those thoughts and emotions is then we get angry at ourselves for being distracted and then we get angry at ourselves for being angry at ourselves because we're not like damn it i was supposed to pay attention and i can't i can't even do that and like that's where again the self-criticism comes in and all you can really do is like you know note it oh i'm i'm feeling angry right now oh i'm feeling frustrated that i can't control my anger and like you don't need to do anything with those feelings you just need to notice them and that a lot of times, because we can't tolerate our negative feelings, we get stuck in this habit where like we start to become aware of a negative feeling. And then we immediately jump to, well, I want to fix it. I want to, I'm going to go watch Netflix. I'm going to go drink a beer. I'm going to go for a run. And sometimes those can be good habits. Sometimes it can be bad habits, but they're all about avoiding the feeling that we have, uh, and if you can just realize that, oh, feelings aren't something that you need to do something about. If you want to do something about it, like you probably could, but if you reflexively and always try and fix your feelings, then your feelings are never going to just dissipate and go away. Instead, you're going to be sort of a slave to whatever moment to moment feelings arise. Whereas if you just learn, oh, that's, I'm, I'm feeling frustrated right now. Oh, I'm feeling uh, anxious. Okay. Like, then guess what? That feeling will probably just go away. Yeah. And one great way to always replace these negative feelings is, is gratitude. And you talk really interestingly about how that actually boosts the serotonin system in the brain. So can you share with us, you know, how to really do that and what's happening in the brain? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, one of the um, interesting studies I learned about gratitude was about just thinking about moments from your past, from your life that you're grateful for, like happy memories that you can sort of savor. And um, in this one study, they asked people to just think about these happy memories and it increased production of the neurotransmitter serotonin in a key part of the emotional circuitry in the brain and serotonin, just as an aside, that's the, the neurotransmitter system most commonly targeted by antidepressant medications. Um, and so simply by 
guiding your focus to some part of your reality that you appreciate, you can have positive changes in your brain. And the past is interesting because it's something that's always with you. You just don't think about it that much. Uh, um, but there are other, so many other ways to be grateful for as well. Just like simple things in your life, like running water or the people in your life. And if you can just direct your attention to them, uh, then you can acknowledge that you're grateful for them and it has a lot of benefits. Yeah, so since we're already talking about you know, timelines and, and, and looking at the past, most people also struggle with looking into the future too much and they have this, this fear and anxiety. So can you share with us the difference between feeling fear and feeling anxiety and how we should handle those two? Yeah, um, the, uh, so fear is sort of an activation of this certain circuit in the brain that um, really triggers this whole stress response throughout the body. And fear uh, is, is a response to some present danger. Like, I always like to, th to think of these things in terms of like, you know, how early humans reacted, because that's the, that's the way our brains evolved. So you're walking through a field, and then you saw a lion, like, oh, crap, like, that's like, you, your heart stops for a second, and then it starts pounding, and your legs kick into action, you release adrenaline and all this, all these other stress hormones and you start running. Uh, and that, uh, that evolved to like protect you. <laughs> um, cause if you didn't feel fear, then you wouldn't try and like get out of the situation to protect yourself. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing that, though about anxiety is anxiety is sort of an activation of that same, circuitry but in response to the possibility of danger and not there actually being a danger so uh anxiety be walking across that same field where like you saw a lion last week and then every little you know blade of grass moving or every little twig snapping like your heart sort of stops and like you're anticipating uh and you're looking for and you're waiting and you're apprehensive of that lion that's about to jump out at you. Um, and the, the reason why that's so problematic sometimes is that when you're in danger, fear is like making you focus immediately on the present and you're reacting as quickly as possible to that thing. And the good news is that it's a short lived thing because either you succeed and you get out of danger or you get eaten. And, you know, <laughs> and instead of, like, there's only boom. It's like either it's going to be over in five seconds or, you know, uh, one way or another. The problem with anxiety is that there's no end to it. Like you could just, you're like, Oh, okay. The lion didn't eat me in the field. Oh, maybe it's moved to the jungle now. And I'm walking through these trees and like, and it could just drag on forever. Now, anxieties are also something that evolved to keep us safe. Uh, as I say in the book, like you had, you know, uh, like you think of two cavemen who like came to a cave and one of them was like, oh, this place looks like a great place to sleep and just walk right in. And the second one was like, uh, I'm not so sure about this. And like the first one got eaten by a bear because he was sleeping in the cave. And the second one is your great, 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 great grandfather. That anxiety and like mm, feeling, uh, you know, these, these uh, apprehensions about things that helps keep us out of danger. It's just that, so that's a very useful tool. But just like, again, like any tool, you could overutilize that. And anxiety can become a problem when it just sort of is always there. You're anxious about everything and it makes you question everything. And then it actually gets in the way of you living your life. It's not a helpful tool. Like just sort of like a hammer. You're building a house. The first early part of the house, you're putting up, you know, uh, um, the walls, like hammers, extremely useful. And then at some point, you got to put up drywall and you got to put up paint. And like, if you keep using your hammer, well, then you're never going to succeed in building your house. And that's where, uh, uh, like, where sort of self compassion also comes in as an antidote to self criticism. That when we're anxious, a lot of times we get really angry at ourselves for being anxious. And instead, we need to realize, like, oh, 
It's a really useful tool. It was really helpful that time that it made me, you know, study more for finals. It was really helpful when it made me, you know, not uh, go for that job that would have been a terrible choice for like, but at this particular moment, anxiety is actually getting in the way of what's important to me. Uh, and so I'm just going to take a deep breath and yeah, the anxiety will still be there, but I'm still going to keep moving forward and taking action. You know, this is such an important realization, I think, that this anxiety has this underlying positive intention of trying to keep us safe, right? Or trying to motivate us into action or trying to make us run from something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if it becomes the, the underlying baseline of our daily experience of life, that is very detrimental and it's not a very fun life to live because you're always in the, you know, in the lookout for that, for that line to eat you, right? And so you want right. to really, as you say, like use it as the hammer when you need it, but then learn to go back again and, and sort of yeah. self-awareness. And, and, and find that balance. Mm -hmm. Like what makes one person, you know, better at building a house than somebody else is they understand which tools they need to use when. Uh, and so, oh, they start and they realize, you know, maybe they, they get quicker at figuring out like, oh, oh yeah, I keep trying to use this tool. I actually need to put it back in my toolbox uh, and get a different one. Or they realize, oh, I don't have the right tool for this. I need to go develop it, you know, build one or I need to learn it or, you know, and that, that again is where self-criticism gets in the way because a lot of times we're like, I'm so stupid. I should have bought the right tool before I don't have like, okay. It, it doesn't matter what you should have done in the past. Like you, you don't have it now. So either you could go get it or develop it or borrow it or whatever. Like, uh, but a lot of times it's self-criticism like just gets in the way of us being able to accept reality and then choose a helpful path forward. Yeah, this, this aspect of practicality is so interesting to me, right? Because oftentimes we beat ourselves up, right? But it's just not practical in the sense that it doesn't move us forward in our lives. It doesn't help us actually get better now. So, you know, beating yourself up for the past, it's, not, it's just not a very helpful way to go, to go about life. So I really right. find that fascinating. Um, now I mentioned before in the intro, you're actually the three-time ultimate Frisbee coach of the year. So I'm really curious, how, yeah. how, do you, how do you take these lessons that, that you learned from neuroscience and try to instill them in, in, in your team and your players? Uh, well, it sort of, uh, it didn't necessarily happen in that direction. I, um, I mean, I've been studying neuroscience uh, in college, and then I, I started working at a neuroscience lab at UCLA um, afterwards, and that's right when I started coaching the women's ultimate Frisbee team. And... At first, I don't think I thought that those two things were related. Like, I was just, I was really interested in, like, the neuroscience of emotion. And I was like, oh, and coaching Ultimate Frisbee was really fun. And over time, I started to see how much they were related. And in fact, I think coaching taught me a lot about understanding the brain because you can see how people respond to situations that are uncertain or that are important to them and they freak out and stress out and panic. Uh, um, and at first, I think that was the direction that it moved. But then the more that I came to understand about the brain, then I could start sort of going back uh, the other direction and um, realizing that certain things like, uh, recognizing what you can control and can't control is really powerful. Uh, like that was something I learned sort of about sport psychology from coaching. But then I realized like, oh, that's, that's one of the ways our emotional circuitry reacts. Like your fear and anxiety circuitry respond more when something is out of your control. And you don't have total control over your emotional circuitry you have some control of your thoughts or your attention and so the more that you focus on things that are out of your control the more out of control you feel the more it amps up your stress levels and anxiety and the more that you focus on things that you can control the more it gets that um uh calmed down and so uh it's just helpful to realize 
which direction you need to take yourself. Uh, because sometimes when it's a big game and you're really stressed, like, well, you need to just focus on what you can control. Okay, I'm just going to warm up really well. I'm going to tie my shoes. I'm going to eat nutrition. I'm going to, you know, focus on this, whatever. Like, if they go zone, then I'm going to do that, whatever. Like, focus on specific things that you can control, and that helps calm you down. Uh, but other times, like at practice, a lot of – I usually this is the, the – contrast between what happens at practice at practice you feel in total control of everything and so you're not really that excited or motivated and in that moment it's actually helpful to remind yourself like oh like if i don't practice now like and really focus we could lose the game like you actually want to make yourself more stressed out uh but i think what most people um run into is they learn either one strategy or the other, or they know both, but they don't know when to apply it. Uh, and so if you learn to pump yourself up, that's really great for practices all the time. But then there are times where you get to a big game, you try and pump yourself up more and then you just forget. <laughs> you're <already> here, yeah. <laughs> and there are other people who like, they're really good in big games because they're just so calm, but like they're calm all the time and like, they're not really energized. And, uh, there are sometimes people who could do both, but they just sort of randomly try one or the other. And the time to, to, to appropriately apply it is to recognize, oh, what is my you know, emotional state right now? Is my uh, emotional circuitry overactive and focusing on all these things that I can't control? Okay, well, then I just need to take these strategies to calm myself down. Or, like, or am I just kind of like unfocused and lazy? Okay, well, then I need to take some of these other strategies to, to pump myself up. Yeah, again, it speaks to the self-awareness, right? And this, this situational awareness also of like, what is required right now to perform at my best and then find the right tool and the right strategy and the right technique to, to employ in that moment. And so it really can change every time, right? Every time, you know, depending mm -hmm. on the situation, I think that's so important. Yeah. But Alex, on the show, we always love to celebrate failure as a stepping stone to, to growth and to learning. So it's yeah. career. Do you have a favorite failure? Um, I, uh, well, I think one of the things from, uh, from coaching that I, I really failed at was like um, getting too full of myself and thinking that I had it all under control too easily yeah. uh, because when I when I first started coaching um, the like the t it was like a new team and but they like got really good really quickly and then like the next year they were even better and the third year of the team they made it to the uh, to the finals of um, the national championships wow, they got second yeah. place in the whole country and so I was like oh like I was like oh wow I'm like a really good coach <laughs> um and in retrospect I've learned that well I am a good coach but like it wasn't always for the reasons that I thought I was because when you're really successful you have no idea why you are successful there's some story that you can tell yourself oh I'm so successful because and like the story I told myself was like oh I'm so successful because like I'm so smart I'm good at thinking about <laughs> like the strategies and I know everything. And so, uh, you know, the next few years I was like, Oh, great. Like we know the strategies. I got this. I, I, I can just tell them, you know, what to do. And at, around that same time I was, um, starting grad school as well, which was really time consuming. And so it, it was helpful. It sort of fit it made a convenient narrative because like, Oh, great. I don't need to spend as much time because you know, they'll be successful if I just tell them do this and this and this. And then the team didn't do as well. Uh, for a few more years and it took me a while to realize like oh like part of the reason that I was successful earlier on is because I like cared a lot more uh, or rather not cared a lot more but was more proactive about showing the players that I cared about them and helping them with a lot of this you know mental and emotional stuff and like working through their problems and figuring out how to do it and that takes a lot more time yeah. and i think i was got frustrated i was like i don't want to take all of this 
time to like, you know, help people with their psychology and everything. And then I realized like, okay, well then you don't have the time to be a good coach. And, yeah. and then I was, I was like, oh, but I, can't I just do it easily? Like where it just like a magical, I wave a one, like just follow this play and whatever. And I realized like, no, like you can't do it that way. And it was uh, like, and if, if it's okay, if you were fine with, if you didn't have enough time and you were fine with losing, you could sort of accept, well, this is the best I can do at the moment. Okay. But after a, you know, a few years of not being like one of those top teams uh, uh, anymore, I was sort of like, oh, it is really important to me to be a top team. And I realized like, oh, what? Like I've been failing at these key things, the, you know, talking with individual players that one, I actually like and that I think are most important. And so given that... I don't have as much time, particularly then when I finished my PhD program and I was writing a book, given that I don't have as much time, I should stop focusing on all of these other things that like don't matter as much or that, you know, we could get another coach to focus on, you know, writing practices or coming up with the plays or whatever. And I, because like, oh, that's what I've took me in 10 years to sort of realize is like my special skill is like, I should just focus on sort of like, you know, the mental, emotional component and communication and uh, that, um, that I think has really helped me um, enjoy coaching again more and to be more effective, even though I don't have as much time and really help the team uh, to succeed. Well, wow, absolutely love that story. Now we talked about so many different you know, tools and techniques today. If you could give our listeners just one piece of advice or one challenge to take away from this, what would be that one thing? Um, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. I think the, the most important lesson that I want people to understand is, you know, when you're really struggling, like, it's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, struggling is like a natural part of being human. Like, if you, if you never struggle, then it probably means, you, you know, maybe you're like a psychopath who never really thinks about other people and you know what like struggling uh means that you care a lot about things and you don't have perfect control over it and that's fine uh so i think that's that sort of sense of forgiveness it's an element of self-compassion that i want people to understand and then from there to realize that okay like but you have some tools or there's some tools that you can learn uh that can start to change uh, your life for the better. And you probably have a lot of tools already that you've, you know, figured out in the past what makes you happy, but you just, you didn't realize how important they were. Like, yeah, I used to exercise and used to read a lot and used to hang out with my friends, but like you didn't realize how much that was supporting you because it was just working naturally. Just sort of, as I said, like when the, when the team that I was coaching, they all just got really good. And I was like, ah, oh, everything, I'm doing everything. But I had no idea what I was doing. So in struggling, you can think back to like, well, what was I doing when things were really good? And just, that's a great place to start with, um, uh, with things to try. And if you can't do some of those things, that's fine. If you can't do it, then it's irrelevant. Then stop focusing on the things you can't do and just start to focus on the things you can. And that's why I like to, uh, why I wanted to write the Upward Spiral and share with, with people that like, even when you're feeling stuck, even when you can't do all these things that you used to be able to do, maybe there's so many different ways to create an upward spiral. And so you always have an opportunity to learn some new tool uh, or to try something to um, improve your mental state. Absolutely love that. Now, where can listeners connect with you online? Um, yeah, the, the best place is to go to my website, Alex Corb PhD. Dot com that's corb with a b oh it means basket in german uh exactly <laughs> not uh, um so yeah alexcorbphd.com uh that's where uh, i have my blog um i share you know a lot of um you know whatever new insights i have 
Um, and I, I have some trainings and courses. Um, and that's the sort of the best portal to find me at. Awesome. Now, what does it mean for you to max out your life? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think in some ways I'm really good at acceptance, which is a piece I think a lot of people struggle with. Um, but while that gets me to accept the things that I can't change, I'm sometimes a little too quick to sort of accept things that yeah, I could change with a little bit more hard work uh, and to sort of realize that, um, no, there are some things that are really important to me and I'm going to try doing them and it's going to make me more stressed. <laughs> uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, and so um, at this moment, uh, I think it's about like finding ways to um, reach more people and teach them about neuroscience And that's going to take some hard work by, you know, building better tools and better online tools and, you know, probably some marketing and things and creating sort of, uh, you know, better courses that, you know, people want to take and that they uh, get advantage from. And, you know, my natural sense of acceptance of like, ah, but, you know, I could still be happy without that uh, sort of gets in the way and, and realizing like, no, I, it is my mission to like help people. And I've benefited so much from understanding this neuroscience and I realize that other people could as well. And so it's my privilege to be able to share that with them. Love that. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. All right, guys, that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you gained some valuable ideas, tips, tools, tricks, mindsets, belief systems that will hopefully inspire you to take your life to the next level. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about application. The only thing that's going to set you apart tomorrow from where you are today is how much action you take with those ideas that you gained. And so I really want to challenge you at this point to you know, not just listen to this passively, to not just consume this you know, passively, just think about other things, but to really take those lessons, take those ideas that you just gained and start applying them to your life. So to really start taking action and sprinting towards those goals and those dreams that you have in your life. Now, guys, at this point, I want to ask you for a huge favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider heading over to iTunes and leaving a review as that helps me really grow the show and reach more people, impact even more people around the world. You know, if you have a family member, a friend, a loved one maybe, that you think could benefit from this content, please consider you know, sharing it with them, forwarding to them, as that helps us really build a community of like-minded people that are all about maxing out their lives. Now, guys, with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Stay strong and see you tomorrow.